Uh, before we start, take your um, take your hymnals and open them up to 334 again. That's our opening hymn. Come thou font of every blessing. I went over the second stanza, but I really want you to also look at the third stanza as well. <laughs> Tell me if these words ring true in your own life. If you understand the depth of what the author of this hymn meant. O oh, to grace, how great a debtor. Daily I'm constrained to be. What does that word constrained mean? Does it mean to hold you in? Yeah. No. no. By my choice. Constrained means to actually push. It's kind of a strange word. With the meaning. Paul was constrained to preach the gospel. Something inside of him constrained him. It didn't keep him from preaching it. It pushed him forward. It kept moving him on. Moving him on. Oh, to grace, how great the debtor. Daily I'm constrained to be. If it wasn't for grace, you would have no hope. But because of this grace, it should push you forward to continue to walk faithfully with Jesus Christ. And to show the world... What Peter said, that if the world speaks against you and calls you an evil doer, then by your own works let the world see that you are a follower of Jesus Christ that cannot be talked against. Okay? O to grace how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness like a fetter. What is a fetter? And it's like a pair of handcuffs. Yeah, okay. A pair of handcuffs. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind me closer still to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Is this before or after conversion? This man wrote this. Understand the depths of your human heart. And if you read the bulletin inserts, uh, what Ricky puts in there? Read the second one that's from the Spirit of Prophecy where she writes about how hard it is to try to uh, change somebody who thinks they're perfect and thinks their relationship with God is good when in actuality it's not. What she says is that we must stay humble understanding who we are in this flesh who God is, and that it's only as you continue to hold the hand of Jesus Christ that you receive that grace, and that that grace will change you day by day, that you grow from holiness into righteousness into the character of Jesus Christ. But it takes a daily relationship with Him. This man understood it when he wrote these words. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart. Oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. I love this song. It's old. The music's kind of slow, but the words are beautiful. And if you understand the song, and you understand the melody, it is a beautiful, beautiful our text this morning is taken from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9, where we'll start. The title of this message is, You Are a Chosen What? Generation. A chosen generation. What does it mean to be chosen? Aren't you special? Isn't that what everybody wants to feel? Don't you want to feel special? And isn't this world, doesn't it give you the opposite? Right? Don't you want to teach your kids that they're special? I'm saying uh, the children that come through the church, don't you want to teach them how special they are? Don't you want to make them feel special? Okay. I want you to understand, who chose you in this text? And he chose you to be special, right? He says that you are a chosen generation, right? What does that mean? A chosen generation. 
You're special, number one, we got that right. You should stand out, right? So if God's people are a chosen generation, and what does it say after that? Now you know last week Peter said that you are a holy priesthood. Now he says you're a royal priesthood. But both texts state that you are this one thing, and what's that? A priesthood. What does he mean by that? Well, if you lived in Peter's day, you understood that the temple services were still going on. Right? Even after the death and sacrifice of the Messiah who fulfilled all those sanctuary services, the services were still going on. And that the leaders and the priests were blind to their real condition. And Peter was trying to help the Christians who now when they went to the temple were not looked at as special chosen, royal, or holy. But if they followed this Jesus, this way, they were looked at being worth, uh, death would be better for them than to be able to come into the sanctuary and defile it. Okay? Now understand that. We have lived 2,000 years on the other side of that. We look as Christians and think, this is what God has called us for. This is what we're entitled to. We live in a country where when it began, it began on the premise of Christianity. Okay? That the things contained in the Bible were there not just for the individual, but for the nation and for the government. And we have taken those things for granted. But the people that Peter were writing for, they had to fear for their lives to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Now you're seeing that all over the world happening again. And this country has always been a bastion for Christian freedom. But brothers and sisters understand this, it will not always stay that way. And as you see your freedoms, not just chipped away, but ripped away, and you're seeing that today, Understand that. You've already seen the President of the United States stand up and say in front of the whole world, we are no longer a Christian nation. I take offense to that. Because I am a Christian. But I also agree with them because we are not a Christian nation. Look at us. Okay? He wasn't lying. Alright? But you need to understand where you are in time in God's time, and what's coming in the future. Now, let me ask you a question. We went over this in my Sabbath school class today. At the Last Supper, Jesus took the bread and the wine, and He totally changed the meaning of it, right? The Last Supper was actually the Passover dinner that they were eating, correct? Now, prior to Jesus changing it, what did the Passover dinner represent? And symbolize the angel, the angel passing over the firstborn when they were to leave Egypt. And that the angel death came through, killed all the firstborn unless they had the blood of the lamb over the doorpost. Right? If you had that blood, the angel passed over that house. But they were also to eat that meal, what? Standing up. Why? Because they were going to leave. And they were going to leave that night. They had to be ready. Now when Jesus had the Last Supper, were they standing or sitting? Okay, after they came into the Promised Land, they could eat this meal sitting down. Why? Because the deliverance had already happened. And they were given the land. The reward. They no longer needed to stand because they weren't going to leave. Okay? So Jesus, when he instituted the communion service, was trying to prepare his disciples for what was going to happen in the hours that was going to precede this meal. Right? What was going to happen? He was going to be arrested. They were all going to forsake him. And then he would be put to death. Right? And he tried to tell them over and over and over again to prepare them. Now listen, Jesus 
went after the meal, they went to the Garden of Gethsemane, right? Uh, there's an amount of olives into the Garden of Gethsemane. What did he tell his disciples to do when they reached the garden? Pray. To watch and pray. and pray. What did they do? Yes. They fell asleep, right? Who was the only one actually praying? Jesus. And why was he praying? <laughs> he was praying for strength that he could endure what was coming, that in his humanity, in his flesh, he would not fail. You ever thought about that? Did you ever think that he worried about failing? What did he ask the Father? Three times. Father, all things are possible with you. If, they, if, if, if it's possible, take this cup from him. Okay? He didn't want to go through that. And he needed the strength to persevere, to endure. And this is the same thing that Peter now is trying to get his followers, the people he's writing to, to do the same thing. Peter, I told you when we started this, wrote the little note and uh, message of 1 Peter to prepare the people for persecution, for what was to come. Because Peter had a first-hand experience of not being ready for when the test came. Right? Did Peter pass his test, or did Peter fail his test? But because he failed, and because his heart was still united with God, he was able to come through that and become the Peter that we know and love. Okay? But when tests come your way, will you pass them, or will you fail it? The only way to know is if you're preparing now before the test comes. Now, how many of you, when you were in school and you had a big test, you know, they always gave that big test, how many of you would wait until like an hour before you went to bed before you actually studied for that test? Yes, see? Now, how many of you waited until you actually got into the classroom five minutes before the bell rang before you first cracked open that book? Corey? Yep. Uh, we outnumber the people that waited the hour before. Okay? <laughs> How many of you passed that test? <laughs> Not me. Didn't say I made a good grade. I That's know. right. <laughs> so listen. So what Peter is trying to get through to his readers here is that there is going to come a time in everybody's life where you will face trials. Uh, and if you've been walking with Christ for any period of time, you know that they come in waves. You have times of ease, where it seems like the devil is slacking off on you, and everything is going, and then all of a sudden, things change that quick. And you feel the pressure of not just the devil, but you feel the pressure of God Pressing down, pressing down. You wonder where is he at? What he's doing? And the question is: Is will you persevere? What does that word "persevere" mean? Endure. What's that right? Hang tough. Hang tough. Endure. Yeah. Um, is it the pressure of God, or is it because God has withdrawn His Spirit from us? I say it's both. Now, it all depends on where your walk is with Him. God will withdraw His Spirit if you are in open sin. Right? But do trials come to believers? Yes. And so when trials come to believers, it's not that God has withdrawn His Spirit from you, but God may be putting pressure on you. Okay? So, and now, understand this. God does not tempt anybody. Right? That's what the Word says, but God will test you. And it's not testing you, it's actually, the test isn't for God. The test is actually for you to see where your faith really is. I always understand that. The test is so that you get a clearer understanding of where your faith and trust in God is. We may think we're here, 
And when the trial comes, we find out really we're done here. But God will be there with you. And if you trust in Him, He'll take you from there and bring you where He wants you to be. Okay, so, Peter says, You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a what? A holy nation. If you truly are a chosen, a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and if there's anything holy in you, you will definitely be a peculiar people in this world. You understand? Yes. <coughs> this is the problem with the Christian church today. And that holiness is not even hardly ever spoken. And when it is, even in the Adventist church, that holiness a lot of times is legalism. A self-righteousness. Can you produce any holiness at all? No. So where does holiness come from? Wow. It's got to come from the Holy Spirit dwelling in you. What makes you holy? God's presence inside of you. And for God's Spirit to live in you, then you have to meet the conditions that are spoken of in His Word. Is that right? So do you want to be a chosen generation? Do you want to be a holy priesthood? Do you want to be a holy nation? A peculiar people. That you should show forth the praises of God who has called you out of the darkness into what? His marvelous light. What does that verse actually mean that God has called you out of darkness into His marvelous light? What marvelous light has He called you into? Is it the light that comes from a light bulb? Enlightenment. Uh, Ray, what did you say? Righteousness. Righteousness. What did you say? Enlightenment. Enlightenment. I like that. What did you say? His righteousness. His righteousness. Listen. Is there deception that goes up, that that is in this world? Absolutely. If you look at the world system, have we not gotten to the age where we call good evil and evil good? Yes. How many of you going to vote? Uh, Tuesday. <coughs> okay, how many of you voted already? Now, Florida has a race for governor. Is that right? <coughs> Your two main choices are a guy that has switched political parties three times, right? He stands for nothing. The other guy made his millions off of building the government yes. through Medicare and Medicaid. So you got a snake and a thief. And those are the two choices that you have, because the other choices are people that you're going to go, who the heck is that? And it's a waste of a vote, right? Yeah. Isn't that a sad state of affairs, that this is what your, your choices have come down to? Do we not call good evil and evil good? So, if you look at the world system, my daughter loves to keep up with the Kardashians. I hate that show. Amen. I hate it with a passion. There is nothing that is good that ever comes out of that show. And I only watch five minutes of it before I make her shut it off because I can't stand it. But you need to understand that that is the way the world is. Now what you see portrayed there is what the generation wants to be. And so, I tell you all that to get you to see what it means to be called out of darkness. Called out of darkness. The darkness that this world offers, the darkness that Satan has engulfed this world in, into God's marvelous light. What is that marvelous light? That light is the truth that is found in Jesus Christ and the truth that is found in the Word of God. Does that make sense to you guys? Amen. Do you stand in the presence of God today? Yes. yes. Do you see Him? No. Okay, so you stand there through a representative. That representative is Jesus Christ, right? So when God calls you into His marvelous light, His enlightenment, what is it? It is the truth that is contained through His Son in His Word. Isn't it? The more you know the truth of the Bible, the more you're able to see the deceptions of this world. 
the more you know the truth of the Bible, the brighter that light becomes and the darker you're able to see this world system being. What that should do is keep you from watching shows like Keeping Up with the Kardashians. <laughs> Help you to realize that if your hope is in politics, you're placing your hope in the wrong place. Politics will never bring you the kind of world you are hoping for. Jesus Christ did not align himself with any political party. Jesus Christ transcends political parties. Jesus Christ rises above political parties. This is why the church can have independents, Democrats, Republicans, and everything in between, and still be a part of the church. Because Jesus transcends politics. But if your hope is based on politics, it's in the wrong place. It's in the wrong place. Because believe me, can you tell me any politician that is a royal priest runs a holy nation? This is the only thing you can say. They are peculiar people. Right. Okay? <laughs> Not in a good sense. Right? I mean, the problem is people. Even, even the subtleness of, of make me stronger in the prayer. Wait a second here. You're dividing yourself. We need to be more dependent upon God. It's even that subtle. I like it. That you should show forth praises of Him who has called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. Do you want more and more of that marvelous light? You want more and more of that marvelous light? Then you need to know more and more of what's contained in this book. Now listen, I watched a program where they showed this uh, Jewish soldier, he was in his mid-twenties, and he had memorized the entire Old Testament. Wow. He memorized the entire Old Testament. Wow. But listen, you could do that and still not see Jesus. Yeah. So reading the Word is not the same as being a doer of the Word, right? Isn't that what James says? No. Don't just be hearers, but be <laughs> doers. Okay? So, Peter goes on and says, Which in times past you were not a people, but are now the people of God. Do you understand what that means? Do you know who you are in Christ. Do you understand, number one, what Christ actually did for you? Amen. Because if you don't understand that, if it's just a surface knowledge, there is so much you will miss. And if it's just a surface knowledge, that's going to be your whole relationship with Him. It's just going to be very superficial. And there's going to be no depth and no root. But when you start to grasp the depths of the sacrifice that the Father made, that the Son made, and that the Holy Spirit made, so that you and I can be saved. Why would God want somebody like me in His kingdom? I say that because I know me. I know what I've done. But let's just take Peter. Peter was a great man. And Peter, when the words that came out of his mouth, he really believed them to be true when he was speaking them at the time. But Peter was self-deceived. I know he was the first pope. <laughs> He's a trumpeter back there. He is. So that isn't what I said. Now, now, now think about this. Think about Peter. When Peter said to Jesus, even if all of these deny you, and he's pointing at you, he's pointing at me, I will never deny you. I'll die for you. Did he mean it? Yes, yes he meant it. He meant it with all of his flesh. And how good was that? Do you understand now why Paul continuously writes in his epistles the difference between walking in the Spirit and walking in the flesh? Sometimes I speak about that so much, I don't know if you guys actually grasp what that means. This is the difference between a victorious Christian life and a failed Christian life. It's the difference between whether you will be Peter in his unconverted state before the death of Jesus Christ, who says, Lord, I will die for you. And the moment a little girl came to him and confronted him, what did he say? No, no, no. 
Don't know the man. He cursed. Don't know the man. But now, after Peter was restored, did he ever deny his Lord again? No. no. Now, here's something for you to think about about Peter. How would you like God to tell you how you're going to die? <laughs> Decades before it's going to happen. And when he tells you how you're going to die, you find out you're going to be crucified. One of the worst ways you would ever die. Now, Peter had to go to bed every night knowing how his end's going to be. So, see, when he was in jail and the angel came and woke him up, and, and now this man was sleeping because in the book of Acts, when he was in jail and he was chained up and he was sleeping, how did the angel have to actually wake him up? Slap him across the face. And Peter still didn't know whether he was awake or not. It wasn't until he was outside the jail that he actually woke up enough to realize this isn't a dream. Now, do you see, that's peace. Now, did the peace come because Peter knew, hey man, Jesus already told me how I'm going to die, and it's not going to happen today. I'm not worried. Okay? Or was the peace that, I still don't care what's going to happen. My life is in His hands, and whatever happens, happens. Okay? Think about that. Think about the change that you see in not just Peter, but Thomas. What did Thomas? Thomas has a nickname. What is it? Yeah. Yeah. Now, how would you like to be doubting Ray? <laughs> and 2,000 years from now, people are going to remember you as doubting Ray. Doubting Thomas. Now, after he placed his finger in the wounds of Jesus, do you ever hear him doubting again? Okay. You think Thomas died a uh, nice, peaceful death in old age? Absolutely not. Listen, this is one of the greatest truths and proofs that the New Testament is true. Would you give your life for a lie? Some of us will. Politicians do it all the time. But would you be willing to die a really, really, really horrible death for a lie? And these guys didn't. Okay? What changed them from running away to staying?